Hi everybody. So today we are going to do a little lesson on amino acids and polypeptides. Now we're going to be adding these each week so you can follow along with me. Hopefully you can learn to support what you're doing in school or in college or with me at my Edspace. Um, and even if you're in year 13, this is excellent revision, right? So the ones we're going to be doing over the next few weeks are all linked back to biological molecules, which really forms the foundation of A-level biology. So this is really going to support you with revision. Um, or if you're in year 12, you're going to be learning this along with me. Stay tuned till the end because we're going to go through some uh, recall questions and some exam style questions as well at the end of this video. So grab yourself a pen and a piece of paper, follow along with me and make all of the notes you need. So firstly, amino acids. They are the components of proteins. So the amino acid is the monomer that makes up a protein or a polypeptide, which is the polymer. Uh, obviously, amino acids are made from four key elements. So we've got carbon, we've got hydrogen, we've got oxygen, and we've also got nitrogen. So this is one of the elements in an amino acid that is not found in, say, a carbohydrate or a lipid. Some also contain sulfur, but not all amino acids. In fact, there's only one amino acid, which is called cysteine, that actually contains sulfur. So remember, not all amino acids contain sulfur. And if you are asked to name the elements that all amino acids contain, we're going to go for carbon, hydrogen, oxygen and nitrogen. Now, amino acids are called amino acids because they contain an amino group and an acidic group which we can see here on the diagram. So this is our amino group here, sometimes called the amine group, and this is our NH2 group. We've got our carboxyl group over here, which is our COOH group. We've got the central carbon in the middle with a hydrogen coming off of it and the R group. Now the R group represents the variable side chain. So all different amino acids have a different R group. This is what makes them all different. The rest of the amino acid is the same in all amino acids. So they all have the amine group, the central carbon, the hydrogen and the carboxyl group. But what is coming off of that central carbon in what we call the R group is going to be different for all amino acids. OK, now you have to be able to draw an amino acid. So we're going to do it together. You can either draw it like this, which is how we had it on the previous slide. So I've got my central carbon, I've got my carboxyl group, I've got my hydrogen and I've got my R group. And then I've got my NH2 or my amine group over here. Even more simplified if you want to, you know, learn as little as possible, basically. But it would still get you all the marks. You could do your central carbon with your hydrogen and your R group. And then you could simplify the carboxyl group to show it like this and simplify the amino group to show it like that. Both of these diagrams would get you full marks in an exam if you're asked to draw the general structure of an amino acid. Now we're going to go ahead and just label the main groups. So we've got, again, we've got the amine group over here. We've got the carboxyl group over here. Then obviously we've got the hydrogen, the central carbon and the R group, which is the variable side chain. And we can see here we've got all of those elements, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen and nitrogen. Remember in cysteine there is sulfur in the R group, but in the other amino acids there is no sulfur. So practice that a few times. Make sure you can draw your own amino acid, that you can label the groups. And yeah, that would be a nice question to get on your exam paper. So there are 20 different amino acids that are naturally occurring. Now remember, what's in the purple box here is the same for all amino acids. So we've got the central carbon with the hydrogen, the carboxyl group and the amino group. Now the R group, which is outside of the box, this is what's going to be different for all 20 of these amino acids. Now you can see here that they've done the R group on top of the central carbon and the hydrogen below the central carbon. It doesn't matter which way around you draw them. And you might see in the exam, if they give you diagrams of amino acids, they might have the R group on top or the R group below the central carbon. 
Now, luckily for you, you don't have to learn all of the different amino acids. You don't have to know the names of them and you don't have to know the specific R groups. All you need to draw is the general structure of an amino acid and understand that the R group represents the variable side chain. But if you are interested, here are some examples of different amino acids. So we've got three. We've got serine, we've got cysteine and we've got leucine. And you can see the R groups just underneath the central carbon in these examples. So let's just circle them. So serine, you've got the R group here. Cysteine, which is the one that has sulfur in the R group, you've got the R group here. And then leucine, this whole section is the R group. Hopefully the rest of the amino acid you recognise, you've got the amine group, the central carbon, the hydrogen and the carboxyl group. Now, when two amino acids join together, we call it a dipeptide. So a dipeptide would be two amino acids joined together. And when two amino acids join together, they are joined with a peptide bond. So you might remember that in carbs, we had glycosidic bonds. In lipids, we had ester bonds. Whereas now in our proteins, we have our peptide bonds. But the formation of this bond does involve the formation of a molecule of water. And it is another example of a condensation reaction. Now, condensation reactions make bonds by removing water okay so we're going to show now how two amino acids join together with a peptide bond in a condensation reaction to form a dipeptide so two amino acids join together so you can see amino acid one on the left you can see amino acid two on the right these are just general structures of amino acids we don't know which two they are but to join them together we're going to remove water like this okay so we're removing the oh group from the carboxyl group of the first amino acid and we're removing the hydrogen from the amine group of the second amino acid so if we remove that hydroxyl group and we remove that hydrogen what's going to happen is we're going to form a peptide bond between this carbon in the carboxyl group and this nitrogen in the amine group of the second amino acid and obviously we have to remember that we are removing water so water will be another product of that condensation reaction what i'm going to do over here for you is draw the resultant dipeptide Okay, so I'm drawing two amino acids joined together with a peptide bond. So I'm going to put all the easy bits in first. Okay, so it would look like that. And this is what we call a dipeptide. So let's just put a bracket around that. So this is two amino acids joined together. It's called a dipeptide. This here is the peptide bond, which is a strong covalent bond forming between the carbon of the first amino acid in the carboxyl group and the nitrogen of the second amino acid in the amine group. You can see that all we've done, let me just put these back on for one second. All we've done is we have removed that hydroxyl group, we've removed that hydrogen, we formed the peptide bond between the carbon and the nitrogen, and don't forget, we have also made water because we removed a molecule of water. So this is an example of condensation reaction, forming a peptide bond and forming water. Now you have to be able to maybe draw a dipeptide in an exam, or they might ask you to circle the groups on the two amino acids that would be removed if you were forming a peptide bond. So obviously you would circle this hydroxyl group and this hydrogen because that's what you're removing. They might ask you what else is formed in this reaction and obviously the answer to that would be water. Okay, what about the opposite then? So now we're gonna think about hydrolyzing a dipeptide. Now the word hydrolysis, if you break it down, you've got water, which is the hydro part, 
and you've got lysis, which is the splitting part. So we're splitting apart this molecule by adding water. So hydrolysis breaks bonds or hydrolyzes bonds. And we're going to hydrolyze this peptide bond in this example. So what we can show here, if we show the addition of water, so we're adding water to break the bond or hydrolyze the dipeptide, imagine adding water back there. You've got two molecules of hydrogen or two hydrogens, sorry, and you've also got an oxygen. So you're going to put one of the oxygens and one of the hydrogens back onto that carbon and you're going to put one of the hydrogens back onto that carbon. And what that will do is break or hydrolyze what was the peptide bond, okay? So you're adding water to hydrolyze or break that peptide bond and ultimately what you're gonna get back at the end of that is two amino acids. So if I draw the end result for you quickly, you're gonna have two amino acids. So you're hydrolyzing the dipeptide back into its component part. Component part, so you're going to be back with two amino acids. You've added water, you've broken or hydrolyzed the peptide bond. So you put the hydroxyl group back here, you put the hydrogen back onto the amine group of the second amino acid, and you've now got two amino acids or two monomers back. Let's have a go at some questions then to see what you've learned. Now, these are just kind of quick recall questions to check that you've been paying attention and that you've understood the video. But stay tuned because we're going to look at some exam style questions as well. So you can always pause the video at this point and have a go at answering the questions and then restart it and have a look at my answers. That would be my advice. So question one, name the elements found in all amino acids. Now, when it says name in the exam, don't just write the chemical symbol. You must actually name the elements, okay? Because some students might just write C, H, for example. That's not going to get you the marks if the command word is name. So we're going to name carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. We're not going to name sulfur because it's only found in one amino acid and not all 20 of them. The bond found in a polypeptide is a peptide bond, or you can just put peptide. Obviously, a polypeptide is many amino acids joined together. So we've only really looked at the structure of a single amino acid and how we make a dipeptide today, but a polypeptide, remember poly means many. So a polypeptide is just many amino acids. And if you uh, come back next week, we're going to be posting another video on the whole kind of protein structure story going from polypeptide all the way through to quaternary structure of a protein. OK, so that'll be the next video that we do. The type of reaction that makes this bond. So if we're making a bond, it's a condensation reaction. What else is formed in this type of reaction? Obviously, it would be water or H2O. How do amino acids differ from one another? So we're going to say they have different R groups. So it's that variable side chain that is different. The rest of the amino acid with the carboxyl group, the central carbon, the hydrogen and the amine group, all the same. So it's only the R group that differs. How do polypeptides differ from one another? So it could be the number of amino acids in the polypeptide. So obviously they'd be different lengths, they'd have different numbers of amino acids. Also the sequence or order of amino acids. And obviously it could also just be the amino acids that they actually contain. So they might contain different amino acids, but in biology we often talk about the different sequences of amino acids because that's going to be really important when we go on to talk about protein structure. So it's the sequence or the order of amino acids that's really different. That will obviously vary from one polypeptide to the next, but also the number of amino acids in the polypeptide itself, which would determine the overall length of the polypeptide. Okay, let's have a look at some exam style questions. So for question one, we're asked to draw a box around the R group this amino acid. So have a little look and see if you can spot it. 
So we are, and again, pause the video and have a go. You can have a go at both of these questions and then come back to watch the answers. That would be a good idea. But the R group, we're going to put a box around this whole section, guys, because here I can see the central carbon. Here I can see the hydrogen coming off of the central carbon, which all amino acids have. Here I can see the carboxyl group that all amino acids have. And here I can see the amine group, the NH2. They've just written it slightly differently. So everything here above that central carbon must be this amino acid's R group. Okay. Question two, draw a box around the part of this amino acid that is the same in all other amino acids. So this time we are looking to do a box around all of this. So if it's the same in all amino acids, we should have in that box the amine group, the central carbon, the hydrogen and the carboxyl group. This is obviously the R group for this amino acid, which is what varies from one amino acid to the next. Let's move on and see if we've got any more questions. We've got two more to do. So this is the amino acid alanine. And we can see the R group there is CH3 for alanine. Draw a diagram of the dipeptide formed when two molecules of alanine are joined together. Label the bond and show anything else that is produced. So we're, we're kind of being guided here because this is a three mark question. So they're telling us to draw a diagram of the dipeptide number one, label the bond number two, and show anything else that is produced number three. So first of all, let's do the dipeptide. So we're joining two of these together. Okay, so I know I'm gonna have two amino acids, it's two alanines in this case. So I'm just filling in the missing part and I know that our group here is CH3 because they've shown it me over here so I don't just have to put our group I can actually put CH3 because we've got two amino acids alanine joining together Then I'm going to go over here and complete this amino acid again it's alanine so I'm putting CH3 I'm going to put my H there now remember you're not going to put these groups. So you're not going to put this hydroxyl group and you're not going to put this hydrogen because they have been removed when that dipeptide has been formed. Remember, it's a condensation reaction. So we remove water. So we should have removed that hydroxyl group and removed that hydrogen. So the dipeptide looks like this and you're going to get one mark if you've drawn that correctly. Label the bond. So the bond is here and it is a peptide bond and it's between the carbon of the carboxyl group in the first amino acid and the nitrogen of the amine group in the second amino acid. So I'm gonna get my second mark and my third mark, what else is produced? H2O or you can write water because condensation reactions involve the removal of water. That's where that hydroxyl group and that hydrogen went to, right? So you'll get marking point three if you've remembered that as well as the dipeptide, you're also producing water. Finally, question four, little link back to GCSE revision. Where does protein synthesis take place in the cell? It's at the ribosomes. Now, if you're studying cells already in A-level biology, you'll know that there are ribosomes in the cytoplasm. There are also ribosomes attached to the surface of the rough endoplasmic reticulum. And why does it link to this topic? Well, when we talk about protein synthesis and what happens at the ribosomes, this is where the amino acids actually get joined together. So this is where these condensation reactions are taking place and these peptide bonds are being formed to join the amino acids together and actually produce the polypeptide. It's actually, if we're gonna be really specific, it's translation that happens at the ribosomes, which is the second stage of protein synthesis, which you'll learn later on in year 12 but this is where the amino acids actually get joined together in this way. And if you have enjoyed this video, if you found it useful, make sure to like the video and subscribe to my channel because we're gonna be posting videos like this every week as well as loads more content for you. So this is gonna be invaluable if you're in year 12 and you can do this as extra revision as you're learning this content, but also if you're in year 13 and you need to revise your year 12 content, right? So you can be really confident with it to help you with your year 13 content this is going to be amazing. So we're going to be posting videos every week, biological molecules moving through into cells and working our way through all of the specifications.